Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting Harvesting Happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where we will explore Minding the Dash, Forging a Meaningful Life. My guest today is Professor Dean Rickles. He is a professor of history and philosophy of modern physics at the University of Sydney and the co-director of the Center for Time. Dean briefly trained as a concert pianist at the London College of Music. He is the author of many books, including histories of string theory and quantum gravity, and two recent books, one of which we're discussing today, Life is Short, an Appropriately Brief Guide to Making It More Meaningful, as well as Dual Aspect of Monism and the Deep Structure of Meaning, which was co-authored with Harold Ottmansbacher. And I am so pleased, Dean, that you're in the house. It's bright and early in Sydney, Australia today, and I appreciate you starting your day with us. Yeah, you're welcome. All Good right. Well, let's talk about the dash, you know, about what we fill our time and our lives with. Well, I mean, so one of the big themes of the of the book is precisely this idea of what we choose to spend our time on. And obviously, you know, in the modern world, we are so full of distractions and we're sort of taught to just be busy, busy, busy all the time to talk to work. We work until extremely old ages now, and they keep pushing up the retirement age. And um, so one of the themes of the book is it's, it's kind of based on this older view of Seneca. It's in this older book of the Stoic philosopher Seneca, who has this very famous little short, also a very short book, as is mine, book called the, On the Shortness of Life. And that book is very much about the dash. In fact, its sole focus really is about this idea of buzzing through life, not really settling on anything, not really having time to enjoy it. And by the time you do think, okay, now I'm going to enjoy it, then it's too late to enjoy it. So he has sort of lots of lots of nice examples about, you know, how people say, I'm going to sort of just keep working now and I'll do that thing that I want to do. I'll take that trip that I want to do when I'm 50 or in this, you know, in the future. And they're always making ready for the future rather than actually living. So they never end up living at all. Well, and it, it's almost like a conditional joy or conditional well-being. You know, when I get rich, when I get thin, when I get this, when I get that, then I yeah. will give myself permission to have these things that I want. Yeah. And well, and the condition is usually tends to focus on exactly wealth, making enough wealth to do the thing. Rather yeah. than doing a smaller version of something now, which would still give you, you know, plenty of joy. Yeah. In your book, Life is Short, you talk about the wastage of time. And I do like that phrase. Give us some examples. I mean, I think I know where you're going with this, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, in the so we are extremely good in modern times, you know, with the wastage of time. Part of the problem is there are just so many um, ways so many more ways of wasting time these days, so many more options. We think of options as a, as a nice thing, but they sort of, you know, many people have pointed this out in recent books, they lead to a kind of paralysis, an analysis paralysis, where you're trying to figure out which one to do. So you bounce around between various options and you never really take one, uh, any kind of option in very fully. The worst ones, the worst examples, I think, are internet-based and technology-based I think this is a, sort of a pretty obvious thing. I remember there were early books that were pointing towards the kind of problems that we see now, such as uh, Nicholas Carr's The Shallows was a good one. I don't know if you remember that book, where he's pointing out that 
we're sort of losing our ability to even attend to certain things fully and be immersed in experiences because we're constantly bouncing onto the next thing. Social media, you end up spending so much time just browsing through other people's lives or trying to figure out what, what you want to project out to the world about yourself that you sort of stop focusing on making yourself a certain way. It's all about how you present yourself to be a certain way. And then your time is consumed with doing that rather than doing real things. It's all conducted at this virtual level. So I got rid of writing this book. I got rid of all of my social media. I used to do Facebook a little bit, not really, and Twitter a little bit, and then got rid of both of those things. And uh, and there was a big improvement, actually, almost in- instantly. Well, you have more more space in your day to live your own life, you know, to occupy your own life, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, and it's exactly, that's the correct word, is living your own life rather than trying to present something. Or as, as teenagers do, especially, teenagers are, are built to mimic and copy. It's sort of part of the way that they get on in the world. So they spend their time looking for the thing to be. And they will copy the various fashions. You know, this is this has always been the way, but it's sort of just so much more accelerated these days. And there's, it's so much more in their face because they're always on these platforms. And I, God knows what platforms exist now. They keep changing all the time. Facebook is for dinosaurs. Twitter is for dinosaurs. There's even, these even, even faster versions of, you know, of what you should be and flashing these, you know, um, images and brief videos of here's the next thing that you need to focus on. Here's the next challenge that you have to do. So as you say, yeah, you can't really ever settle and just be yourself. And it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about mimetic desire. And I think this is a little bit about what you're speaking, right? That that we look to mm-hmm. these external sources to model who we think we should become rather than being internally referenced and letting our own compass guide us there yeah i mean obviously one of the problems is that the algorithms that these technology platforms use are precisely designed to do exactly that to get inside your head (laughs) so that you are so that you are mimicking it so they're trained they're trained to do this and you'll be pulled in more and more and what's really interesting is that you you've probably heard of this new uh sort of controversy in ferrari about chat gpt this new ai yes model that where you sort of type in what you you know some question and it gives out these very human responses but the way those models work the way this technology works is it doesn't know what it's going to be first until you sort of give it clues as to what it is meant to be and it's almost as if we're turning the next generations into versions of artificial intelligences that have to be sort of programmed it has to be programmed into them what they are going to be, what their sort of foundation is and what their self is without that, without being told by looking outside and having this sort of mimetic training. They don't know what it is that they're supposed to be. And the fact that they're always on it means they never get a chance to figure that out independently. It's interesting that you speak of this. I have two young adult children and both of them really don't use social media. They've deleted a lot of their accounts. I mean, I have one that loves TikTok because it's like a complete distraction to her. But they, <laughs> yeah. but uh, they, neither of them are big posters. And they say, you know, I don't, I'm not interested in, you know, living somebody else's life or putting mine on display. And I thought that was a very healthy response. Yeah. That's good. I mean, you would think, I mean, it should really be trained, not trained, it should be sort of presented this way in schools, I would think. I imagine your kids are like this because they've got a mother that presents a podcast called <laughs> Harvesting Happiness, which helps quite a lot. But, uh, I don't know yeah, if they a, would cop to that, you know, <laughs> but, but I think you could be right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, yeah, my, my older daughter is the same. She doesn't go on it much at all, but she does go on U- YouTube and, you know, YouTube does this thing where it, YouTube is another really bad one for the wastage of time, which is what we started off talking about because again it's the algorithm it sees it trains itself on what you are looking for and then it will give you exactly the thing that you want that it thinks you want and and it's a completely sort of statistical way it does it it's not really you know it doesn't know anything about you but it's as if it knows exactly your deepest desires and it feeds them to you 
It's not personal, but yet it is very personal. And it's actually turning you, us, collectively into our data, a form of capital, which is really annoying. Oh, that's exactly what it's doing. Exactly. Attention is the is the capital in the in you know the social media world keeping you on and plugged in is the is the capital exactly well, what a terrible thing yeah and the data it feeds to product makers so they continue to create stuff to sell to us so it's like this vicious cycle so at that point you say i'm out <laughs> at least for me you, you should. I must say, I sometimes do. I still go on U- on YouTube because there are amazing things on there. But you've got to be savvy about how the that algorithm is working, and that nothing is free. You think you're going on to these things, and you think this is free of charge. This is fantastic. It's about. It's certainly not free. Nothing is free. We know this. And as you say, it's the data is being sold in order to keep you even more hooked into this to this scheme. Basically, I do have to say. You know, as a as a funny aside, that I did learn how to descale my coffee maker, my very posh coffee maker, on a YouTube video because, like, it came with no instructions. The 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 um, descaling solvent. So I, I was very impressed yeah. that I could go there, and there were eight hundred and ninety five videos to teach me how to do it. Yeah, what puzzles me, I know there's something for everything, anything <laughs> you could possibly think of on YouTube. I want to, I mean, who are these people that do the videos? I mean, you know, it's great that they do them, but I can't really imagine putting a video on there to show how to descale a kettle. I don't, but I'm glad they they are, you know, they're on there. It was, yeah, I was too. It was the, it was the, it was the product maker it's themselves that did it. So that was, I knew I was at a good source yeah. anyway, that was legitimate. And in three minutes, you know, I, I had figured it out. So I was very pleased. But those kinds of moments are few and far between. And that actually felt like a really good use of time. Exactly. So this is the thing, again, so it sounds like we're bashing technology itself. And we're not. And obviously these, no, these technologies have amazing possibilities, especially for, for education purposes. And, and they can be fun. And you find, you know, what, what I like to do is find these old videos of old piano performances or something or these kind of things or old really old physics lectures of my favorite physicists from the 1930s or something and for that kind of thing it's absolutely amazing you wouldn't really get it anywhere else and if you sort of so if you're selective and you dip into things like this there's absolutely i can't see any problem with it but it's when you sort of go get pulled it's almost like you're going to a trance i've done it myself with certain things you get pulled into a trance and follow where it's pulling you this um, data stream by manipulating you and, and sort of reading what you want next. That's the thing to watch out for. And there should really be some, you know, it should be part of education now to teach the kids how to not be pulled in down these paths. You know, and I think understanding the way the brain operates is not something Absolutely. that is taught to any of us, right? Like if you end up being interested in psychology or psychiatry or even yeah. philosophy, you, you come to have a basic understanding about this, but the average person does not. And once you do understand, I think it's easier to learn how to, how and when to say no. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, we know it's not hard either to explain how the reward system works and how the dopamine system works. Really young kids could understand it and they could see it in their own behavior, how it happens to them and then be aware yeah. Sort of, you know, taught how to spot the signs when they're getting pulled by a dopamine hit. Let's take a pause and come back and talk about the dopamine urge, because I think that that's an important subject. And before we go to that break, I want to let everyone know that you may find Dean Rickles out there on the Internet in the ethers at Psychology Today. <laughs> that he keeps a low digital footprint, but you can find him out there because he's got a blog and he's got books. So look for Dean Rickles at Psychology Today. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Before we head to the break, let me share one of my secrets for healthy hair and great hair days. 
Did you know that 30 million women in the United States are impacted by weakened or thinning hair? If you're among them like me, you're not alone and there is a solution that you can trust to deliver great results. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement that's clinically shown to improve hair growth, thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting the five root causes of hair thinning, stress, hormones, environment, and metabolism through whole body health. That's why I'm a huge fan of Nutrafol because it goes beyond genetics to target the factors that impact hair growth. Now is the time to have lovelier locks and better well-being with Nutrafol. Start by visiting Nutrafol.com to take the hair wellness quiz for customized product recommendations. Did you also know that thinning is different for men and women? Nutrafol has multiple unique formulas that provide exactly what we need based on our biology and age. Each physician-formulated product uses natural, drug-free, medical-grade ingredients in consistent doses for reliable results that I have experienced firsthand. In a clinical study, 86% of women saw improved growth after six months of use. More than 3,000 top doctors and stylists recommend Nutrafol as an effective and high-quality solution for healthier hair. What I love most about Nutrafol is that in addition to beautiful hair, the ingredients have helped me improve my sleep, stress response, skin, and nails. Who wouldn't want that? A big shout out of thanks to Nutrafol for helping me grow fuller, healthier, and happier hair from the inside out over the past several months. Join me and millions of others who are celebrating great hair days with Nutrafol. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code HAPPINESS to save $10 off your first month subscription. This offer is only available to U.S. customers for a limited time, plus free shipping on every order. Get $10 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code HAPPINESS. Now let's take that break. We'll be right back. Each day we have the intellectual freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable, regardless of external circumstance. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, urge them to seek professional support because good psychological health is vital in achieving a satisfying life. Visit HarvestingHappiness.com for psychosocial educational resources to boost emotional and social intelligence. Like what you hear on Harvesting Happiness, sharing is caring. Pay it forward by spreading the word to your tribe through social media. Find us at Harvesting Happiness on Facebook and me at Lisa Kamen on Twitter. And we're back. But before we return to the conversation, I want to shout out how I'm obsessed with Skims Fits Everybody Underwear Collection. And I must say that all the hype is 500% true. This underwear is so stretchy, soft, comfortable, and non-binding, it feels like it just melts on my body. In fact, I forget I'm even wearing it. Skims is the solution-oriented brand creating the next generation of underwear, loungewear, and shapewear for everybody. Right now, I'm wearing the Fits Everybody Dipped Front Thong, and I have to say, I'm a convert. No visible panty lines, no annoying binding edges, just pure, flattering comfort and joy. I'm in love with skims and never going back to ordinary undergarments. The Fits Everybody collection of underwear are lightweight, form-fitting essentials. The buttery soft fabric molds to your body and stretches to twice its size. It's offered in a range of cuts and fits from underwear and bras to dresses, t-shirts, and bodysuits. Available in sizes extra extra small to 4X and offered in nine core colorways and limited edition seasonal colors. Believe the hype. This collection has over 90,000 five-star reviews for a reason. Skims fits everybody and more best-selling essentials are available now at skims.com. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75, all at skims.com. Now let's get back to it. And we're back continuing the conversation with my guest today, Dean Rickles. Let's get back to it. So Dean, let's get back to dopamine. You know, this seems to be the chemical that every human being and probably animal lusts after, even if we don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are sort of famous animal experiments, since you mentioned animals, where 
uh, so even sort of even rats can be trained to almost um, trigger their dopamine response to the point of death yeah. to get this sort of little reward system. They will keep going to this machine, pressing this little button that gives them this dopamine spike that makes them feel good. And they would do it until they die that you can make rats into dr- drug addicts essentially very, very quickly. Obviously, that's what's going on in all of the uh, the addictions we have. So I don't really mention this in the book, but it connects very strongly to this um, to one of the ideas in the book, which is the um, Jungian notion of individuation. So I spend quite a lot of time in the book co- talking about individuation, and that really is a way of getting this reward system and this you know the fact that we keep wanting to do certain behaviours because of the reward we get trying to get that under control. And it's connected, it's strongly connected to the ego because it's the ego that's going through trying to get these responses to make itself feel good, to make itself bigger and stronger and all of these kinds of things. And the reason why I like this, um, the Jungian approach, which fell out of of favor for decades, I think it's coming back in in fashion again now, I hope, um, is that you get this ego under check and the dopamine um, system under check by stepping back away from the from the ego and watching the what exactly it is that's pushing it around right so we, we tend to think that we're in charge and we're making the decisions and we're deciding what we do and what things we take individuation is the procedure of stepping back and seeing that really that ego is like a Jung puts it as a cork being bobbed around in an ocean right we're really not in control most of the time and individuation is the idea that you step back out of it and see what it is that's pushing that cork around. What, why is it that you keep that you need a particular kind of response? And usually there's some kind of complex or some kind of trauma that led to the to you feeling the need to keep um, going back to these sort of addictive behaviors in the first place. You mentioned the rat experiments, and I'm thinking of the rat park experiments, right, where there were there were two sets of rats, I believe it was, the one mm-hmm. set of rat that mm-hmm. had access to the cocaine or heroin-laced water, oh, yeah. but mm-hmm. lived in community with all these other rats, and how very few of them would go and occasionally take a little sip of that water, but when they were living in community with all the toys and being able to procreate and have fun and party with one another, none of them actually became addicted because they had the, 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 the secret sauce of social connection. Wow. Yeah. I actually don't know those experiments. They sound very good and they make perfect sense from the point of view of what I've just said, of course, to do with the trauma and neglect. Obviously, you're, what's happening is the dopamine is giving you the thing that you should be getting, yeah. as you say, from other connections and from other sources. Yeah. I mean, I noticed there was there was a somebody mentioned something about my book the other day, which hit home a bit, which is that it doesn't really mention these um, sources of connection and getting meaning from connection. And it's absolutely right. And I, sh- I mean, if I'd have written that book again, I probably would have mentioned that these are also, these are extremely strong sources of meaning. And what all my book was doing was showing how death provides uh, one big source of meaning. But obviously this community connection is a huge source of meaning as well. There's not just one source of meaning for your life. Often we speak of the the meaning of life as if there's just one answer to that. But obviously there are all sorts of um, possibilities that provide life with a meaning. And to, this connection is, is a big one. But to go back to the, the looking at life or experiencing life with the end in mind, it is a mm. universal experience, right? I mean, it's mm. one that we will all go through at some point or another, and by having that understanding that at some point our lives as we know it will cease to exist, for somebody who is at least a little bit contemplative will say, well, hmm, maybe I should pay attention to how I choose to live now. Well, you know, we started speaking about distraction and the dash. I think a lot of, a lot of the source of that is a sort of, you know, there's, there's this thing called terror management theory by this guy Sheldon... I forget his surname. He has this really nice book called The Worm at the Core. And the idea is that death and the specter of death is the worm at the core of our life. And often what we're doing when we're doing this dash and distracting ourselves is distracting ourselves from that worm at the core. And we're engaging in 
terror management theory. We're trying to trying to we're trying to avoid the terror of the fact that we will not exist at some point. So I think a lot of a lot of the distractions are sort of pushing us away from that. So a lot of people don't think very much about death. And one of the other themes in the book is this personality profile, the Puer Eternus or Peter Pan syndrome profile, which exists in such a way that it sort of feels like it's not going to die. It feels unlimited by things like death and other limits, in fact. And then it misses out on meaning because it's because it doesn't have that limit and it doesn't feel limited. It's never having to commit to particular paths. So there's sort of a bunch of um, interesting uh, entanglements with, the, with, with these concepts. Indeed. Indeed. And I think what we're talking about is not morose. You know, I think... You know, there's a very interesting university project. Oh, God, it was I forget which university. I'm sure it's been done at several where the students were asked to write their own obituaries. And I thought that was a very powerful exercise that forces one to look at how we want to be seen, how we want to be experienced and how we want to be remembered. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, that's a nice study. And I suppose it would force you to put what you would like your obituary to be. So that's kind of forcing you to think a bit more. And this is the point of the book. Death is sort of this flashing sign that narrows your focus so that you can construct a a meaning, carve basically a meaningful life. So that at the end, you're sort of, you're happy with what you've done. And there was another study, there was this famous Harvard longevity study where they asked people at the end of their lives who were, you know, very close to death, what were the most meaningful things and what their advice would be. And and it actually tended to focus on what you said earlier, which is the the connections, the social connections. Nobody mm-hmm. really regretted not making more money. Nobody regretted not making more money. <laughs> Never crocked up anywhere. What they regretted was loss of um, social connections that could have happened that they could have been doing. Yeah. And the, I think the loss of opportunity, right? Like things that they didn't do that they would have liked to have done. Yeah, but what's interesting is those things that they didn't do were were never sort of consumerist or, you know, that they didn't didn't get the Ferrari that they always wanted or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, but this shows, this sort of highlights the point of the book, which is that it's, if you didn't have that limit there, if you didn't face death, you wouldn't have these realizations. It wouldn't force you to choose so there's a so it's a philosoph- it's a philosophy book, and the the argument is that that limit of death forces. So you view your future as a series of possible paths, possibilities, none of which are, which are real yet. They're sort of virtual reality. If if you didn't have that limit of death, you would never be forced or pressured. There'd not be no urgency to choose a particular one. But it's only in choosing a particular one that you say who you are, that you're determining and defining what makes you you and having experiences that build your past that also make you you. So there's huge meaning in just making these decisions, because in each of these decisions, what you're doing is sacrificing other possibilities. And it's sort of in those sacrifices that you'll get that I think that you're gaining a whole uh, extra load of meaning in your life. I agree with you. And it brings me to the point of your book, Life is Short, of philosophy being really the ultimate self-help tool, right? To ask these provocative, open-ended questions of ourselves and others to ponder. Yeah. I mean, it it always was this way. It's only recently that philosophy has become this sort of, I don't know what the word is, this ivory tower discipline. It was usually presented until quite recently as a a tool, basically a way a way of life, and especially a way of learning how to die. One of the definitions of philosophy, I think it was Montaigne's definition, was philosophy is a way of learning how to die, and it's sort of getting ready and making ready for the inevitability of it. So that it's almost like a, a form of, um, of of Buddhism in a different way, a more sort of intellectual version of Buddhism. Uh, that came to my mind as you were speaking, and not the notion of a soul uh, or a singular death, but the willingness to go through multiple cycles of birth, death, and renewal in one's own lifetime as well. 
It's not yeah, well, mean, not the ultimate exit. You know, there are multiple opportunities. Uh, exactly. So, I mean, you know, this is the idea of learning how to die before you die yeah. and seeing that you carry on and seeing that when you do that, this is how new things happen, how creative things happen. It has to be born from the end of the old and chaos and and nothingness. I mean, one of um, Plato's, I, I, Plato has this idea that philosophers, because they they are supposed to be dealing with these sort of abstract forms, that not quite reality, but something beyond reality, they are making themselves already used to the idea of beyond life states and what the thing that's beyond death. Obviously, Plato believed in all sorts of things like um, the transmigration of souls and, and whatnot. So he, he viewed it as preparing for that, for being ready for this non-spatio-temporal kind of existence that happens afterwards. Um, yeah, we certainly lost a lot of these kind of ideas in philosophy, which is a shame because it's just a great tool for getting your head around existence and purpose and meaning. I, I don't know why this isn't taught in schools either. It puzzles me. Well, it was a hundred years ago. <laughs> it's just not exactly. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I was France, coming apparently. up a hundred years ago, it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, this conversation is the kind of brain food that I love to explore on this show because it's provocative, right? You know, I hope our listeners yeah. take this home to their own dinner tables tonight because it's it's a big topic, you know, getting, having the opportunity to choose how we show up. We might not be able to control a lot, like you say, right? Or like Jung talks about being the cork in the ocean, but we can choose how we show up for life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where the meaning, but in my view, that's where the meaning is. I mean, not only that, another thing that the book ends with is the fact that when you're making these choices, you're not only making choices for yourself, you're also taking responsibility for what happens to the universe, or at least the little bit of the universe around you that you influence. So you're sort of carving your, your self and you're carving the world around you. And one of the reasons people don't like to do that and don't like to make decisions is because you have to take responsibility when you make a decision and you act on that decision. And people don't like to make decisions anymore, it seems. But that's like the, that's the mark of an adult. The mark of an adult is to make choices that matter and then take responsibility for them. So there's, you know, with this sort of social media craze and the distractions, we seem to becoming per perpetual children, basically. Which, you know, might have its virtue now and again, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it energizes. It's quite good to be childish, yeah, sometimes. It gives you, a, you know, a good view on life. But to sort of live your life entirely in this um, childish manner and not choosing and not taking responsibility is probably not so good. I mean, I, I sort of prefer to talk in the book, I sort of talk about the balance between a pair of poles. You don't want to be too boring and stagnate and go too far towards the Senex, which is this old man energy. But you don't want to go too far towards the Puer Eternus, because that's kind of, it's sort of puerile and childish. You want to be balancing and passing back and forth at the appropriate times between these two poles would be the sort of the wise way of, of living, I think. The responsible human who's not afraid to go out and dance in the rain, you know? Maybe somewhere yeah, like that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're out of time. And I hope you'll come back and talk more about this with me because there's so much to explore here and so many ways to help people ask big questions, you know, of themselves and the people that they love, because this is what makes mm. for an interesting and meaningful world to have conversations like this, at least for me, you know, I'm in my happy place. Mm. Yeah, I would be glad to. I like the name of this podcast, by the way. It's a very good title. Oh, it's very, thanks. Very nice. Well, we do talk about the annoying yellow smiley face, and this is this. We're not talking about happyology here, right? We're talking about something really yeah. much deeper. Yeah, no, but it has this idea of um, of you know sowing to reap and reaping what you sow, and figuring out how to do that. Yeah, it's very good. And it's a process. It is a practice. That's what I have come mm -hmm. to learn in this life for myself. We're talking about you and your book, Life is Short, an appropriately brief guide to making it more meaningful. I urge our listeners to find Professor Dean Rickles on Psychology Today, because that's where he's hiding out in the ethers. No other digital footprint. 
and <laughs> come back and hang out anytime. Seriously. Yeah, that would be good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dean Rickles, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. <laughs>